I'm here with uh, Bob Rooney and uh, Patty yeah. McKinday. Okay, and uh, you're the author of the the book, the Frankie De Paula uh, Jersey Boy. Jersey Boy, but what's the subtitle on it? The Life and Mob Slaying. Mob Slaying. Okay, uh, a uh, noted, not not really, not really a very high um, high up in the ratings no. fighter, but a noted local Jersey City fighter, That's right. locally famous. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, um, and. Um, from back in the 60s and uh, uh, actually was shot, what, in 1970, 1970 and died in 1970, yeah. okay. And this is 2011, yeah. <laughs> as we're taping here. And uh, But uh, there's something in common. Bob, you're uh, director of the uh, uh, Bayonne PAL um, boxing program. And uh, did you say that uh, DePaula came up? Uh, through that uh, organization? He did actually when he left uh, prison in uh, the early 1960s and he fought out of uh, Bayonne uh, PAL and actually went to the uh, New York Golden Gloves because uh, this part of New Jersey came under the jurisdiction of New York City and uh, he fought in the New York Golden Gloves novice category and won it scored a knockout uh, in all of his uh, bouts and um, you know, the interesting thing is that the New Jersey people always felt they, they, they got a raw deal, they get a raw deal in New York but there's always been this uh, uh, tradition, uh, a bit of folklore, a bit of reality among uh, New Jersey people that uh, when they were under the jurisdiction of uh, New York uh, their fighters tended to get a raw deal. Uh, they didn't get a big break when it was a closely fought thing with a New York kind of fighter. And so, uh, really, they needed to uh, have the, the proverbial uh, judge in their fists, you know, like Marvin Hagler said. And that's exactly what Frankie DePaula did. <laughs> Frankie DePaula was an interesting character. One thing that he did not seem to be is a role model. That's right. I mean, as a kid, he was the archetypal juvenile delinquent, you know, in and out of reformatories. And he, he started off at the parental home right here in uh, Bayonne, which is now the Marist School, the actual building site, but it used to be a parental home for uh, unruly kids. That's how he started off. And he, uh, he graduated for want of a better word to the penitentiaries, you know, Rahway and uh, Trent and the rest of them. And he, uh, he, you know, there was that side of him that was very well-meaning, you know, and there are people who will defend him to this day and you have no reason to disbelieve them. And uh, so he had that uh, good side to his nature. Um, but uh, the record uh, speaks for itself, uh, in and out of uh, trouble, and trouble was his constant companion. And uh, Let me what? cut you off there, because, yeah. uh, because uh, Bob, you, and it didn't just start with you, your father before you, uh, I think was looking to develop a different type of fighter, right? In the sense of somebody that could be a role model. Oh yeah, discipline was always big with my dad. You know, it wasn't just about learning how to fight. He had to be a gentleman. Uh, he would routinely check the report cards of fighters to make sure they were doing good in school. Otherwise, he wouldn't allow them in the gym. Um, if any news ever got back to him of anyone street fighting or getting in trouble in school being a disciplinary problem, he would uh, he would get his arms around that as well. And, and you know, he preached. <clears throat> He preached uh, not only being a gentleman in the gym, but behaving yourself when you're not in the gym, when you're at home, and so forth. So um, that's a tradition that I tried to carry on, and, and uh, you know, with my fighters, and, and you know, we I don't just train these guys. They come over my house, uh, we eat together, um, you know, and, and I often ask them how they're doing in school, and. Uh, you know, we're like a family. Let's talk about a uh, couple of the guys that you have uh, working out now. Uh, 
going going into this uh, gloves tournament? Well, I have uh, the uh, my light heavyweight Spider. He's uh, he's 17 years old. He's a senior at Bayonne High School. Uh, he's got seven fights. He's fighting in the in the light heavyweight novice division this year. I have Roberto Ortiz, who is also a senior at Bayonne High School. Uh, both do well in school, never a problem in or out of the gym, uh, nothing but gentlemen at all times. And, and uh, they work hard and we get good results. Okay. Now recently, uh, I was here like a year or so ago and you had a, you had a kid that, that uh, graduated from this program. He, he went on to school. Tell, uh, that was uh, Stephen Hanau Escobar. He graduated Bayonne High School. He started here, started his boxing career here. Um, he aspired to attend West Point University, so we looked into it to see how much he was allowed to compete to qualify for their team. And um, he wasn't allowed to exceed five bouts. If he exceeded five bouts, he would con be considered, uh, you know, too experienced, too experienced yeah. to qualify for their team. So we got him five fights. He won all five fights went on to uh, attend West Point his freshman year. He made it to the semifinals of the national tournament. His uh, sophomore year, he made it to the final of the national tournament and lost. And last year, he made it to the final again and won the national championship. And uh, me and my dad actually went up and attended the fight. Uh, West Point actually hosted the Nationals this year, so uh, we, he performed really well, and um, it, it was great to see him finally get that national championship, which he'll probably repeat this year. Okay, so this he's year, a senior this he's year. A senior this year, right? All right. And you he got comes back on the weekends. He comes here on the weekends, trains with me. Uh, I take him to other gyms to get him sparring. I have him up in uh, in Passaic training with me, where he spars with world champions. He spars with Kendall Holt. Uh, he spars with Henry Crawford, Jeremy Bryan, all very experienced pros. Um, some of them with national, also with national amateur championship pedigree. Okay. And you're still fighting? I'm still fighting. Okay. I'm fighting April 2nd at Bally's Casino in Atlantic City. Abby, back to you and back to, uh, back to Frankie. Frankie DePaula, if he was alive today, he would be in his 70s or around 70, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So... The people that know him or knew him at that time, they're around that age. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and I was mentioning that I took your book out and showed it to a couple guys, and they were naming all the names. You had uh, the people that you named in that book, they were naming them before they read it. Mm -hmm. And also saying, I can't believe somebody put this in a book. All right. Can you uh, talk about that a little bit? That. Yeah, I think... Uh the Frankie DePaul story is uh, it's all part and parcel of the uh, the mystique and the hold of the of the mob, you know, uh, over this part of the uh, United States. But of course, the mob penetrated all angles of uh, American society for many decades. And as I mentioned in the uh, preface of my book, um, the Frankie DePaul story was a story that was known to many people in Jersey City uh, but it wasn't something that was spoken out openly uh, and that was simply because it, everybody knew it was a mob hit although the conception was it was designed to look as if it wasn't a mob hit that he, you know, uh, but um, and in terms of uh, writing a book you know I've sort of uh, looked at the passage of time uh, that you know certain people have died and the hold that the mob has has diminished over the years for various reasons uh, but it is uh, very very true to say 